All right, believe it or not, it is August 20th. Can you believe it? Summer, I know. Oh, summer is winding down. And one of my favorite parts of summer is travel. Uh, I don't know about you, but I loved travel, especially growing up as a kid. A road trip was one of my favorite things. And my family had one of these. Specifically, we had a Ford Tioga. I couldn't find a good picture. It's this thing back here. That's the Ford Tioga, and that's me, and apparently a pumpkin big enough to take a picture of, and my mom, she's going to kill me for putting that on the screen. But That Ford Tioga was such a cool part of my childhood. Uh, I love this because we got to go to places like Fort Wilderness in Disney World, and we got to go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, we got to go to Hilton Head, and man, they were such good trips. You know part of the reason they were such good trips for me as a little kid? Because this thing was like a time machine, right? So my parents got in the car at like 3 or 4 a.m. and dealt with the traffic and dealt with all the, the trip, the trip take from AAA and all that to navigate us through all those states over 10 hours. And all that time I was on the queen-sized bed in the back of this beast. <laughs> and it was like a time machine because I just woke up and it was like, oh, where are we now? That was the first question that I always asked because when my eyes opened, it was almost like magic. The air felt different. The air was maybe humid. It was maybe warm. There were different sounds all around me. There were different sights. And so I began to ask this question of mom and dad, like, hey, where are we now? Not in like, a, are we there yet, kind of complaining mode, but more in like a mode of, man, this is magical. This is great. We're the same family. I'm the same Billy. They called me back then, Billy. But I'm in a new place. There are new things to see. There are new things to do and enjoy. And so I asked this question, where are we now, I wonder if you've ever asked that question. Maybe it was on a cross-country vacation. Maybe it was overseas. I don't know about you. Maybe it was even in different stages of life. Maybe kids, maybe here you've gone from middle school to high school, and you're looking at this new place, maybe this new building, maybe new teachers, maybe new friends, maybe new rules, and you're thinking, where, where are we now? I'm the same person, but I'm in a new place, and I've got a lot of new things to see and a lot of new things to do, a lot of new things to learn. Or maybe you're in a new workplace, and you have new coworkers and new norms and new, a new culture, and you're thinking, where are we now? Maybe you're a business leader, right? We have a lot of business leaders in the church, and for you, you know that every few years, every, every season of life, you have to step back in the business and reevaluate, hey, where are we now? Uh, that's true even for churches, right? So a lot of us feel like the COVID-19 pandemic was basically that magical time machine Ford Tioga. Like, did that really even happen? <laughs> like, we look back on those years like, wow, that was weird. And then we open up our eyes and the, the, the climate that we live in feels a little different. There's, a, there's something in the air that's different. There's different sights and sounds and different things to see and do. And if we're smart, as a church, we ask this question, where are we now? And so listen, uh, I ask this question, and I use this set of graphics every few years, because it's something we do every few years. We evaluate uh, where we are as a church and where we're headed. And this morning, I want to tell you, listen, um, I want to preach the question, not the answer. Because the answer is more than I can do alone. The answer is more than the staff can do alone or the elders and deacons can do alone. The, the question and the answer belongs to all of us. And so I want to preach about the question. And I want to inaugurate a season of us all together leaning in and listening to God and listening to each other and listening to our community and asking this question, where are we now? What's the same and what's changed and where are we headed? Uh, so in, in the spirit of doing that and equipping us as a church to enter this season of asking this super important question, I want to give us just one principle this morning among many that I could give you, but I just want to give you one that's on my heart for this season for our church. And it is this, 
there, there are some things that are true no matter where you are. And I think one of those things is this. Wherever we are, we're blessed to be a blessing. And I think that's one of the things that we need to hold on to and think about deeply as we navigate uh, this new world that we live in now. We need to be asking this question as a church, uh, you know, based on where we are and who we are, uh, how are we blessed to be a blessing? Because we are blessed. And so we're going to find that principle. You can find it actually all over Scripture. That principle is all over Scripture, but this morning... I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to center our thoughts around this parable that Jesus taught about how Christians, all of us, and I would say even churches, we are blessed for a reason, and that reason is to be a blessing. Uh, so before we read and study God's word together, I always want to ask that we pray that God would speak to us through his word. Let's pray. Well, God, we're entering the fall season now with uh, a lot of anticipation and a lot of excitement. It's been a great summer, God. We have seen you do amazing and wonderful things at this church. We've witnessed people coming to faith. We've seen our community grow. We've seen our fellowship participation grow and even double. We've seen our outreach continue to grow. And now as we stand at the door of a new season, a new ministry year, God, we're just praying you'll give us clarity around where you're leading us. Because, God, we don't want anything except for your will for us. And so now, God, I, I know that you speak to us through the scriptures. And I'm asking, God, that you would speak to us about this issue from your scriptures. To speak to us about what your will is for us as individuals and as the church. And today I'm asking God, you would remind all of us of a few, few things. First, that we are blessed. We are blessed, blessed, blessed in this church. And second, that we are blessed for a reason. So remind us of this today, we pray, and help us listen well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you are turning to Matthew chapter 25, uh, I want to orient you, as always, to what we're about to read. Uh, the, the Bible is structured into the Old and New Testaments, and the New Testament begins with four accounts of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. So Matthew is an account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection written by Matthew. Who's Matthew? Matthew was a tax collector that put him on the outskirts of society. He was an outcast. He was hated. He was viewed as a sinful, despicable person. And Jesus came to Matthew and he said, follow me. And so Matthew followed Jesus and actually became one of his closest followers, one of the 12 disciples. So uh, at the end of everything, Matthew decided, I'm going to write down an account of what it was like to be with Jesus. And so he organized his gospel into these large chunks of teaching, uh, like the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, is one of them, and they're arranged topically. And so what we're reading today in Matthew chapter 25 is from what's called the Olivet Discourse. Big word, but it just means it's a discourse. It's a mini-sermon. It's a, a, a teaching from the Mount of Olives. And the topic for this teaching is the end of the world and what's going to happen at the end of history, at the end of time. And so if you look at the context here, Jesus is spelling out for the folks, hey, listen, this is what it's going to be like. I, from right here moving forward, things are going to start moving quickly. I'm going to die on a Roman cross for your sin. I'm going to die the death that you owed God because you're a sinner. I'm going to die in your place. And that's not the end of the story. I'm going to rise to new life. That's not the end of the story. I'm going to ascend back to heaven to be with God the Father. And guess what? That's not the end of the story. I'm actually going to come again. That's what we call the second coming. And so the second coming, Jesus, it's going to be wild. There's going to be trumpets. There's going to be an army of angels. It's going to be glorious. And, and, and his followers, they're listening, and they're like, this is really cool, Jesus. It's also, frankly, a little scary. I mean, it's, it's a lot to take in, Jesus. And, and by the way, one of our questions, Jesus, is what do you want us to do between now and then? You're going away, 
So what do you want us to do? I mean, if you're not going to be away long, Jesus, I'm thinking maybe I just quit my job. Would that be cool? Would that be good? Uh, Maybe we just phone it in. Maybe we just take it easy. Maybe we just coast and wait for you to show up again. Maybe it doesn't matter what we do because you're coming again. And to that, Jesus says, absolutely not. That's the exact wrong and opposite attitude to have. And he tells these parables about watching and waiting and working. Working in this time between times, in now, in today, in our time. This is what Jesus says his will is for us now. So let's dive right in. I want to begin this morning at verse 14 in this parable. Again, Jesus says it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. And the first word I want us to latch on to is simply this, that Jesus says it will be like something. And what is the it? It's, it's the second coming. It's the end of history. It's the kingdom coming. And he says, it is like this. And then he, he tells a story. Uh, this is what we call in Christianity a parable. And it's one of my very favorite things because as human beings, who doesn't love a good story? Who doesn't, I mean, there might be a few people here who would say, I, I learn best by abstraction and equations and just a bullet point of facts. Is that you? Nobody, right? We all love stories. Maybe that's why I opened with one today. Uh, we all learn by stories. We all remember by stories. And Jesus taught with them all the time in parables. Uh, and by the way, just a little tease, once we launch into fall, uh, September 10th, I think, is the day. don't have my calendar open. But we're starting a series through the parables of Jesus. It's going to be awesome. But for now, uh, listen, Jesus says this. I'm going to tell you a parable to help you understand uh, how we should behave in this time between the times. It's going to be like this. Here's the setting for the story. So there's a man, and he's going on a journey. We later find out this is a very wealthy man. He almost has like what could be called a kingdom. he's, He's done very well for himself. And he called his servants in as he's getting ready to leave town. And what does he do? He entrusts his wealth to them. And so he effectively says, guys, I've got some business to take care of way far away uh, for an undetermined amount of time. And while I'm over there, I want my wealth to keep growing. I want my kingdom to keep growing. And I'm going to trust you. Look at it hidden here in this word. I'm going to trust you to get that done. Here is my kingdom for you to steward while I'm away. Okay, what will happen? Plot development. Verse 15, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. And so here's what he does. He gives away part of his wealth to these folks. If you're reading a different uh, Bible translation, you might not see bags of gold. You may see instead the word talent. Anybody have that? That's because the Greek word is talent, right? Now, the NIV chose not to use the word talent because there's already the English word talent, And if we just bring the Greek right in, it doesn't mean the same thing. Talent, as we know talent, is not talent here. Uh, Talent here simply means, in the Greek language back then, talent was a weight. It was a measurement, specifically of silver or gold. And so what Jesus is talking about here when he says he gave five talents or five bags of gold to this first servant is he gave him a lot of precious metal. In fact, most people think it's 100 years worth of the average wage back then. Here, the master says, is everything you would make in your entire lifetime, or the average person, and I'm entrusting it to you. Large amount of money. Same thing to the next servant. It was five for the first. It was two to the second. That's like 40 years of wages. And one bag to the third servant. That's like 20 years of wages. Millions and millions of dollars this guy hands over. Talents, we would say. And now the question is, what happens? So he's given them all this money, and let's see what develops next in this parable. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. 
So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So there is a few approaches here. The, the different servants, the different characters in this story, they, they went about handling their master's money with different approaches. Here's one approach. The, the first two servants, they put his money to work, and they, they set about building the kingdom on behalf of their master. But the other servant, the third servant, he did something very different. That was he dug a hole in the ground. I said three and I wrote two. That was kind of weird, wasn't it? There we go. So the question becomes, listen, of these approaches, which one is the right one? If you're following the story, you don't know yet. I mean, honestly, if this is your first time being exposed to this story, you really don't know. The master is going to come back, and what is he going to do? He might look over the situation and look at that third servant and say, wow, thank you so much for taking such good care of my money. That is an excellent hole that you just dug in your backyard, and look how safe it was. I mean, these other two, I don't know what's wrong with them. Yeah, they happened to double my money, but they could have halved it. They could have made me bankrupt. So third servant, good for you, good on you, way to go. So which approach was correct? Was it preserve and protect? Or was it invest and increase? Two different ways these servants went about stewarding what their master had given them. Which one will the master like? And which will he not like? So verse 19, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. That's ten total, right? We're doing math here. Sorry about that. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. And it's almost like if you read between the lines here, you can sense this guy's excitement. You can see the gleam in his eye, the pride that he has. And he's just bubbling over with excitement like, Come, master, you've got to see what I did while you were away. Look at the ledger sheet. Count for yourself. You have 10 talents now, 10 bags of gold now. How will the master react? Okay, let's see. Verse 21, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Oh, a great reaction. Couldn't be better. So first he says, man, I approve of what you have done. Well done. In fact, good job. I approve of your approach. And he says, listen, because of that, I'm going to put you in charge of even more things. I trust you. You've proven faithful. And I'm going to entrust you with more, more responsibility. And third, he has this reward for him, which is entering into his master's happiness. But even more than that, I want us to key in on one word right here, and that is this. He calls him a faithful servant. He had taken good care of what the master had entrusted to him. And so, so the master compliments him and says, man, you are faithful You've been a good steward of what I've given you. I want us to remember that word this morning and this whole season. Now, what about uh, the other servant, number two? So the man with two bags of gold, he also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. Let's do some more math. That's four. Four bags. And so I wonder if this servant has a little bit less of a gleam in his eye, and he's thinking, oh, no. I just saw servant number one, and he had 10 bags of gold. He had 10 talents. He, he had like 200 years worth of wages. We're doing a lot of math on stage all of a sudden. And he's looking at his little four bags, and he's thinking, oh, man, he can't be happy with this. Is that the case? No. Listen, it's the same. Look at the words. The same exact words. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things I will put you in charge of many things. 
Come and share your master's happiness. Jesus, excuse me, in this story, the master uh, tells the servant the same thing. Listen, it's not about what you started with. It's about what you did with it. And so you are faithful over what I gave you, what I entrusted to you. And so well done. Enter your master's happiness. Okay, by this point, uh, we're wondering what's going on with the third guy. Maybe... Maybe the other approach was okay, too. Maybe, maybe he enters the story. We get to verse 24, and it's like, uh, uh, you know, it, yeah, still a good hole. I mean, at least you kept my money. I'm happy with that. I didn't lose any money. Is that what the master is going to say? Let's find out. So at this point, the third servant's coming up. He's third in line, and he's got his bag. He's just dug fresh out of the hole. And uh, maybe he had a spiel ready to go about how, how wise it was to bury the money, but he kind of sees where things are headed. So he goes right into making excuses, right into excuse mode. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. Here it is. Here's back what you gave me. And I love that the excuse this brilliant person chooses is an insult. Um, Notice what he's, here's his excuse. Master, you are a hard person to work with. In fact, I don't know about your character, Master. You like to harvest where you have not sown and gather where you have not scattered seed. In other words, you are getting rich off of my back You want to make money off of my work, and I'm not about that. And so listen, here's what happened. I didn't want to do that, frankly, and I just put your money in the ground, and I went to make some money for myself. And I went about my own life's business, and I went about my own priorities, and I went about my own agenda and my own calendar, and I left your money there in the hole because I don't want to work for you, because I want to work for myself. I want to make money for myself. I don't really care about you, is what he's saying. So his master replied, verse 26, you wicked, lazy servant. And there's some sarcasm here, right? You have to read it with the right language. So, so you knew that I harvest where I've not sown, huh? And you knew that I gather where I've not scattered seed? Okay, well, well then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, So that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest, at least. Uh, The master is saying, listen, so even if you were right in your assessment of me, you should have done something with the money so I could at least get a few percent interest. But I want you to look at his assessment of why this whole thing went down, where this got off the tracks. And it's this word, his He's saying, listen, the problem with this is not your, it's not my character. You're saying my character is the problem. It's not the problem. The problem is your character. And your character is that you're lazy and you're wicked. That's the opposite of faithfulness in this parable. One servant was faithful. The other was lazy. Uh, The other servant played it safe. And I like to think of it this way. At the end of the day, at the end of this parable, it turns out the safe option wasn't safe at all. The safe option wasn't safe at all. Look how this story ends tragically in verse 28. So take the bag of gold from him, the master says, and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that brings us to the end of the parable. It's a pretty shocking ending. It's a pretty shocking and horrifying punishment for uh, laziness, for sloth, for taking the safe route, for taking the easy route. Why is that? I, I think it's because this reveals the heart of that third servant. The heart of the third servant was not love for his master, was not a willingness to follow and obey and serve his master. To to pull us out of the analogy for a moment, this third servant was not following Jesus, did not have faith in Jesus, was not in a saving relationship with Jesus, and his actions proved it. 
So let's zoom all the way back out. Now, what does this parable mean? Three servants entrusted with different amounts from the master's kingdom. Two approaches, invest and increase, or the other approach, just protect and preserve the safe route. And listen, in Matthew's account, Jesus doesn't explain this. It's almost like he doesn't need explanation. It's so clear. Like, hey, he doesn't need to say in the parable, I'm the master, and I'm going away, and I'm coming back, and while I'm away, I expect you all to not just watch and not just wait, but I expect you to work. I expect you to grow my kingdom on my behalf. I expect you to be my hands and feet. I expect you to be a blessing to people. It's like Jesus doesn't even feel the need to explain that because it's so obvious. But there's a parallel parable in Luke's gospel, and this is the way Jesus explained it there. He says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Can we pause for a second? Wow. I mean, that just hit me anew, right? Like, uh, we we are people who've been given much. That's the point of the sermon. Uh, That's where all this is headed this morning, right? As individuals, we are people who have been given much in this room. As a church, we are people who have been given much as a church. And the point of this parable and other parts of Scripture as well, a theme of Scripture is from everyone who's been given much, man, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Look at those words in blue. Jesus says, if you've been given much, there's much that's going to be required of you. And that's, uh, frankly, a little scary, right? It's a high calling. But uh, let me put some slightly less scary words around it for a second. It's simply this. As God's people, we're blessed to be a blessing. Uh, As individuals, that's true of everyone in here. If you're blessed, it's not just for you, but you're blessed to be a blessing to others. And that's true of the church as well. As a church, as any church, as our church, we are blessed to be a blessing. Uh, That concept, by the way, comes all the way back from Genesis chapter 12 when God first called out somebody from all of humanity to create a special relationship with him, a saving relationship. That was Abraham. And here's what he told Abraham. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Why? Why? You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Ever since the beginning, ever since Genesis chapter 12, that has been God's will for us. He blesses us in order to be a blessing to other people. And I just want to tell you, folks, the world needs our blessing right now. The world desperately needs what this church in particular has to offer. Don't believe me? I mean, look at this. This is uh, weekly church attendance. I think, I mean, look at this. In 2003, at least half of the elder generation went to church weekly. Now that's down to 37%. Fast forward all the way to millennials. And millennials, it's 25%. Within our own denomination, it's not much better situation. We've lost a third of our membership over the past 15, 20 years. One out of three people who were part of our denomination has chosen to leave. And the stats are even worse once you delve into things like evangelism, which is down, uh, I think, by two-thirds. Transfer membership down by more than half. Transfer growth. Baptism's down by more than half. The world needs what we have to offer. Uh, Which brings me to the application for today, which is simply this. Are you ready? Are we a five-talent church? In this parable, uh, as, as, as you look at the characters and how much they were given by God and entrusted with, Does that ring a bell (laughs) with what's going on here at this church? 
I mean, I just look around. I looked through my photo album last night. I think about fellowship. This summer, we had twice the number of people as last year show up for ice cream fellowship. Uh, and that's like 200 people. Overwhelming. This church loves fellowship, loves welcoming new people. Welcome, by the way, if you're a new person. Uh, discipleship. We've had hundreds of people involved in grow groups and life groups. Here's Dr. Wilson Cunha from the seminary teaching uh, a grow group. Our outreach events are growing as well. We had 300 people at our first block party this year inviting people to come onto our property and learn about Jesus more than double last year. In service, we're serving 200 plus people, uh, families through our mobile food pantry, providing for people in need every month. With regard to missions, we support 21 missionaries globally, and we've even sent out a family of our own. Here they are, the Alcivar family, uh, to go on the mission field. And how about generosity? Oh man, can we talk about your generosity? Last year, you all gave $1.7 million to support all these things that you've seen and, and much more. And of course, membership and conversions, it's not all just about attendance, but we have recovered to our pre-pandemic level of attendance and exceeded it, which is something not a lot of churches can say. And this summer alone, we added just about 30 people to our membership, and we added five people by profession of faith, adults professing faith for the first time, coming to faith through our ministries. And so I want to ask you the question again, are we a five-talent church? Can I get at least a nod or something, like maybe an amen under your breath? <laughs> something. Man, if you've been here for any length of time, maybe, just maybe, you've grown accustomed to the blessing that God has given us here. It's not normal, folks. <laughs> we are so, so incredibly blessed. And the way that we are blessed, the way things are going here, the world desperately needs, the rest of our denomination desperately needs, the church as a whole desperately needs. And so, in this season ahead, I'm asking you to pray with me and help me discern, like, how, how in the world are we going to take all this massive blessing that God has given us and be a blessing where it is needed? Now, I want to point you to, where did I lay it? Here it is. Uh, the latest In the Loop newsletter. This went out in the mail. Some of you have received this. Some of you have not, because your mailman apparently is slower than average. <laughs> but you will get this. Uh, if you're on our mailing list, and you can read about in the consistory report uh, from Jim Ratterink that we're going to uh, begin this season of refreshing our vision. It's just that. It's a refresh, not a rewrite. We're building on the good work that's already been done, and we're just saying, hey, in, our, in this new context, in this world that we live in now, in this community, how are we going to bless them? How are we going to be a blessing with all that God has blessed us with? So read a little bit about that. You'll hear more and more about that as the weeks go on in the bulletin and in the emails. And I invite all of you to pray and seek the Lord's will with us as we sharpen up that vision and refresh it for the next season in our church's life. Uh, but this sermon is not just about the journey that our church is on. I'm so excited about that journey. I hope you can tell. But this sermon is about you. This sermon is about you as well. Uh, this parable is about you. And so finally, I want to ask you, uh, is your faith a serving faith? Because, listen, a saving faith is a serving faith. A saving faith is always a serving faith, as you saw in that parable. Jesus uh, gave for himself. Uh, Titus 2, Paul says, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Uh, that's the purpose you've been saved. If you have been saved, if God has redeemed you and has purified for you, he has done that for a purpose, and that purpose is that you would serve. And so as we enter into fall, uh, man, we've got some great things planned, but listen, we cannot do it without you. We need your saving faith to be a serving faith. There are opportunities all over the place. There's opportunities to greet people, to play instruments, to sing, to run cameras, to play games with youth, to be in the nursery, to teach a class, to lead a group. There is literally an opportunity for everybody. There's no one I'm looking at that can say, oh, there's nothing for me. There's nothing that matches me. No, there's something for you to do. And this church will only be as healthy as the number of you that stand up and get in the game and serve here.
Will you be like the first and second servants who take what God has given you, whether it's the ability to teach or the ability to sing or the ability to love on kids, and will you take that blessing and will you bless other people? I pray you will. Uh, Come meet me. Come meet Julie after the service at the Connections desk. We would love to walk you through that process and find just the right place for you. (laughs) That's her, if you don't know Julie, in the blue. Come find her. Uh, Listen, I want to end where we started and just remind you uh, that we're all on this journey together. And it's like we've been riding in the magic Ford Tioga, the time machine, and, and we are opening our eyes, and we are seeing in our culture and in our community, the context of the world we live in, we are seeing some new things, and we, we've got to do some new things. And playing it safe is not the right approach, according to Jesus. And so I invite you to open your eyes and to take in some of that humid, warm air, and smell the new smells and see the new sights and help us do the new things. And together, let's discern how to use all that God has given us for the good of his kingdom. Let's pray. Well, God, we are a blessed people. And maybe step one, maybe the first application should have been uh, a prerequisite, God, to help us recognize how blessed we are. It's so easy to forget. It's so easy to overlook, God, all that you've done for us personally and as a church. God, in these moments together, even during this last song, would you awaken our hearts and minds to remember just how good you've been to us, to thank you for all the blessings that we enjoy. And then, God, flowing out of that and overflowing out of that, would you begin to reveal to us by your spirit, the ways that you want this church in particular to bless other people, to grow your kingdom. So we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.